My first thought was whether I should use the British accent or not. You know? <laughs> so, but I thought a good choice because it just has a good ring to it, you know. Yeah, I could have done it as American if you like, but I don't know whether know. whether you I would have bought it. Me that. And I was like, well, no. I, I, I can find an American to do it, but <laughs> nah, I, I, I kind of like what you do with and everything I've seen on your site and everything. I listen to samples and yeah. The concept for this study was inspired in part by a combination of over 40 years of personal and professional observations and expertise in leadership and a personal theory that leaders do not practice traditional leadership theory as originally intended, but rather select various elements from numerous theories and merge them into a single leadership practice, also known as non-traditional leadership. How are things in St. Louis, Missouri? They are fantastic, except for the snow we just had. But otherwise, wow, you just uh, had some it's all snow. melting away today. So, see, that's a place I've only been to in the summer. I was in there. I was there in an August. So it doesn't make sense to me that you could ever get snow because my memory of it is it was really hot. <laughs> yeah, uh, we yeah. don't get it as bad as the rest of the country does. You know, it seems like yeah. the rest of the country gets worse weather than we do anymore. So, right, and I it's only been... found out the other day that the arch changed its name a couple of years back or that it was the Jefferson expansion Memorial. Now it's gateway oh, park or something. What's gateway that like? arch and I think it still has that name too, because Oh, does it? Okay. The national park and the park part of it is the national, the Jefferson park or whatever it's called. You know, <clears throat> they it's just did a big, big project there a few years ago where they remodeled everything. And, oh, did know. they? They yeah. still got that clunky little train thing that takes you up the arch, though, do they? Yeah, I don't think yeah. they'll ever be able to change that because just the yeah. way they made it. So, yeah, it's so funny because it's this <clears throat> really, really impressive arch, and then you get inside it, and it's got these dinky little windows to look out. I don't little, know. Yeah, yeah, up at the top and narrow, and the view is incredible. Oh, it's a good view. It's a nice view. Yeah, as long as you don't look out the uh, to the east at the river, you know. Okay. It's all Brown River and Illinois on the other side, so, you know. Right. Oh, you don't talk about <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. Now, you're the president of the Missouri Writers Guild. Well, you were last time we spoke. I'm guessing you're still yeah, the president. Yeah, I still, still am. Yes. So I'm still How's in. that going? Tell us about that. Well, you know, the Missouri Writers Guild, it's a, it's a state organization. It's, um, it's like the top tier, I guess, of writing organizations and we have chapters throughout the state mm -hmm. you know so and it's just for most it's you know networking we do an annual uh, book right you know um contest writers contest for members we do that every year and that's pretty exciting we get to oh, review right. books and award give people recognition and awards yeah so, so that's pretty good you know and is it for writers of, of all kinds of things all kinds of yeah. genres or yeah all kinds yeah we, we don't we don't discriminate or, you know, people who join the organization, you know, they have to be published or at least want to be, you know, they want to write. Yeah. So we accept everybody anymore, you know. Yeah. And talking of all kinds of genres, this book we've just turned into an audio book, <laughs> very different to the last book I narrated for you. So that was Forgotten Soldiers. You know, it was a historical fiction. Yeah. Uh, you know, it takes it spans over forty years. It takes starts in Vietnam and spans to the future. And there's some conspiracy stuff in there and real life stuff. You know, it's a conglomeration of a lot of things thrown together. Yeah, so yeah. That's what that but was. It, but it was uh, a pretty involved story with characters and a journey and set in that historical time of Vietnam War to start with and a Cold War and it, it went through and what. But this book, nothing like that. Nope, nothing like that. Totally different, because I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. So um, <laughs> among the many things I've done, you know, I, I um, you know, I got I got an MBA at the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. and but I got it later in life. I was in my late 50s when I got that. And so I kind of hit it off with the professors and a few of them said, hey, you know, 
you should go get a PhD in leadership and business and stuff like that. And so I did. And so this particular book and audio book we have here on leadership is a result of that going, getting my PhD in business administration and organizational leadership. Right. So, that's so the, came about. the work you did in your study then, this is kind of, it, it's now found another outlet then as, an, as yes, a book and an audio book. Right. So the original published was a dissertation. And so I took the dissertation and put it into this book. You know, I just pretty much, we just pretty much copied it over, edited it a little bit to put it in the right formats. And here we are. So what were you most surprised about when you did the research into leadership? Well, I had my own theories from my own experience over the years, because I was in the army 20 years and I was in you know, got into business after I got out of the army. So I had a lot of experience dealing with leaders, managers, and so forth. And you know, one of the things I came across is there's all these leadership workshops and studies and universities have leadership specialties. But from my own experience, I noticed that, well, most people weren't doing any of this stuff they're teaching. You know, mm -hmm. they, in, in theory, it's just like any theory, you know, you got one track on a theory. This is how you do it. It could be in science or whatever, you know. And so same thing with leadership, you know, all the leadership theory. Whoops, I knocked my <laughs> camera over almost. It's okay. <laughs> so all the leaders, see, I talk with my hands a lot too, you see. <laughs> but all the leadership theories, you know, are pretty much straightforward. You know, go one direction, do it this way, not that way. And what I noticed is nobody was doing that. And hence, I did interviews with people for the dissertation. You know, I had questions. And by the time I was done, my thought was right. I actually had, when you do research, when you get into the academic world of research, they tell you, you know, you got to get so many people to interview. But if everybody gives you the same answer every time, you can stop after 10 or 12 or so. So I stopped at 13. Yeah. Lucky number, you know, because yeah. they all said that they all gave me the same answers. Yeah. Which yeah. was, and the big answer was um, some leaders identified themselves as a type of leader. You know, I'm a tr transactional leader, transformational, and none of them classified themselves in any of these categories. They were just, oh, I do a little bit of this, but I do a little bit of that. It's like a little yeah. dance I did. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, um, you know, so that that was, I guess, a surprise is that people are spending, corporations spend all this money to send people to schools or well, to a weekend workshop or a week thing about leadership. But when they walk away, they say, yeah, it was nice. I learned some stuff, but I won't do it. <laughs> yeah. I won't do it that way. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mesh three or four things together and do it that way. Yeah, so which makes sense, really, yeah. to take the best mm -hmm. parts that work for you because, you know, you can't just bolt on something that doesn't match your personality because it has. you have to, as a leader, you have to be real. I mean, oh, people yeah. can smell BS a mile off. And yes, so yeah. if you're taking a technique that works for somebody else who has a totally different um, personality style, then people aren't going to buy it. You know, you have to mold it into into what you do uh, and who you are to to make it work. So that makes that makes although it was a surprise, it was a surprise for me reading the book too. But um, I can see how that is the best way to work. That's how the best leadership comes about. It's also interesting because you had the results of all the the questions and all the different surveys you did. I had no idea you were the one doing the interviews though when I read the book. <laughs> yeah, that's good to yeah, know, that though. Be... So it really yeah. did come from the source. The author is not reading research and applying research that's out there to the book. You did the damn research. Yeah, did you research. spoke to the yeah. people face to face and got the answers. Yeah. And based on re I mean, the, the title we I came up with was also based on the research because, um, you know, the full title is Leadership but Outdated Theories and emerging mm. non-traditional leadership. So right. by non-traditional, it's like, hey, the traditional theories, the traditional way of doing things, but people are doing it non-traditionally. So that's yeah. kind of how I came up with that title there. So, yeah. 
Did you find successful leaders that did use traditional techniques that are taught? No. Right. So what does that say about how we teach we're leadership? Talking about, we're talking about, you know, the people I interviewed were general officers in the Army. Yeah. Uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Um, you know, all, and the other criteria for the interviews was <clears throat> they had to have been in leadership positions for 20 or more years. So these are all older, you know, uh, 40 plus age wise with 20 years experience behind them and they all pretty much said the same thing yeah yeah you know and um they didn't know one of them like one of the quotes was you know uh, about you know ac about academics because this 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 person was a ceo he said academics like to put things in buckets <laughs> you know do it this way and he he said yeah i'm not i'm not a follower of that line of thinking yeah. you know you do what's best i suppose <clears throat> they're getting if they've been doing it that long they're getting direct feedback on whether their leadership is working or not and they're going to subconsciously adapt their leadership style regardless of what the prescribed leadership formula or whatever it is or teaching is they're going to go with what works ultimately because that's how they've become successful leaders so that makes sense too well yeah and that's it that's where the experience comes in because over over the, you know 10 20 30 years you see you're exposed to leaders whoever your leader was you know and you learn uh, a term like the i said there's there's no such thing as bad training or bad leadership because you learn from that you learn mm -hmm. how not to do things mm -hmm. by paying attention to the people who aren't great leaders. <laughs> so great leaders have even got things to get. So you're still learning place. from them. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And you mentioned how you served over 20 years in the United States Army. Thank you for your service, by the way. Does the Army, by and large, produce good leaders? Because the stakes are pretty high in the military. Yes, I mean, for the most part, to do. I mean, every once in a while, you come across somebody who kind of strays. Uh, the military is one of the only organizations that has a real leadership training. Right. You know, I mean, where you go, they you go to schools for two months or six months. That's dedicated to to learning, to management, to leadership. Right. You know, I mean, like I say the corporations. The business world doesn't have that. Yeah. They have um, trial by fire, I guess you call it. Oh, hey, congratulations. You're the new whatever. Yeah. But there's no formal training. There's, like I said, these workshops, you know, there's these um, courses and stuff that you can take, but no uh, practical, you know, practical application of it. In the corporate you know, world, we often hear about the Peter principle where people are promoted to the the level of their own incompetence is that real sometimes yeah there's there's lots of terms out there like the one you just use or the, the warm body concept you know organizations are desperate to hire people or people get into management it's not because they know how to lead it's because they're there or their buddies with it's the good old boy or good old gal network. Yeah. And they get into the position and then they stay there for a few years because their boss likes them. <laughs> Even though nobody underneath likes, you know, it ain't that they like, it's just, you know, there's, you could all call, call it incompetence almost. I mean, yeah. There's yeah. no set of guidelines or how do you do, how do you hire somebody to be the leader of a, a division, you know, a, an office division or something like that? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, they, well, they, they know the technical part of the job. Yeah. Which is great, which is something that's needed. And sometimes that happens too. Yeah. People get hired into positions who do not know the technical aspect of that job. Yeah. But yet they're supposed to be the, but they're supposed to be the boss. Of somebody mm -hmm. like working in a call center, maybe it'd be a good example. 
I just say that because I know some people who've worked in call centers. It's like they get a boss who's never worked in a call center in their life. Really? They, they worked in a publishing company or something, but they got hired to be in charge of a call center. <laughs> and you're talking about there's IT and technical stuff that goes in call centers that is unfathomable. I mean, it's really yeah. complex. And just hiring somebody who knows how to write a publish a book. Oh, well, here you have been charged now, you know, and so that's, that's, a, that's a big problem across all industries. Yeah. The one industry it's not probably in the problem is in the medical industry. I mean, because doctors are doctors Yeah. Through, up and down the chain, but you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the other leadership issue. I can remember that my politics. first, uh, my first leadership role. I was in radio, as you know, I was a disc jockey and, yeah. um, there was a job going at a radio station I used to be a, a morning show host at. And it wasn't a morning show position. It was a program director position, which is a leadership position. And I'd never had a, 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 a position with that much responsibility to be in charge of the programming of the radio station in charge of about 70 people. And, well, the first thing I did was I put myself on the breakfast show, on the morning show. So... <laughs> I at least got the morning show right as far as I was concerned. But the thing I struggled with the most was what was referred to later when I looked into it as managing up, is I thought, well, I'm going to be in charge here. I'll do whatever I want. And I didn't realize at first that I have a boss and he has a boss and he has a boss. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, running that that way, you know, have them show up once a month and say, why did you do this? And for me to say, well, because well, I thought it was a good idea. You know, I didn't, I wasn't ready to justify. I, and then I, I worked out, you had to be in a way a salesman. You had to, if you had an idea, you had to sell it to the guy above you, get him on board and then implement it instead of going the other way, which was to just do it. They didn't like that. You know, you know, when they, you know, if you moved everybody out the newsroom into the main office or something, or you did that, you had to get every, you made a, a major change in the state because it was owned, it was a company that owned a group of radio stations. They owned about 35 radio stations at the time. And I, I never really got comfortable with that corporate structure. Um, I worked at another couple of radio stations as a program director after that, where I was more hands-on. They weren't part of a big group. And I found that much easier. Do you find that, that people have that same issue when they first take a leadership challenge on, that you've got to manage up? Oh, yeah, definitely. You got, you know, cause you got to know what your, what the, the boss's expectations are. Mm. And sometimes lead, people don't find that out until later. Yeah. After they've done, after they've stepped on their own toes and they've, or they've, yeah. they've done something wrong and then they find out, you know, Oh, I that, found out. All right. <laughs> And you find out where people get hired in the jobs, don't know the job, but the, yeah. the person hiring them expects them to know it, but I have no idea how to do yeah. this job, you know? <laughs> and then another thing that I found several, just over my years, I witnessed a handful of occasions where something will happen, something bad happens within the org. Whoops, I did it again. I keep moving my camera. <laughs> Something bad happens within the organization. Somebody gets fired, right? Yeah. And the upper boss comes in and says, I never knew that was going on. Yeah. I never heard anything about this. Yeah. No one ever told me. Yeah. And that's the other issue. Some people in leadership jobs are afraid to tell their bosses about an issue. Yeah. Well, I used, I used to have a rule that I got from... As a leader of radio stations, he owned, he was from very big radio stations in this country, a bloke called John Myers. And he had a thing that I stole that he was, he said to everybody that worked for him, um, bad news first. If there's something bad happened, he has to know first so that he's ahead of it and he's aware of it. And um, yeah. that really helped because we had a serious situation at one time involving the police arriving at the radio station. It was it was actually very serious. It was a um, there was a, a siege in the town, an armed siege, which is unusual for Britain. And um, I didn't know because I was in meetings that the disc jockey on the air was talking about this siege that was going on, and he was getting people to call in 
and they were basically taking kind of bets on the air how long until this guy gave himself up. Well, then this guy goes and shoots himself. And the police arrived within minutes of him shooting himself. And, and they said to, uh, the, the police came into my office and said, we want to know, you know, what the hell you think you were doing? And I said, I had no idea this was going on. This is yeah. news to me. You're telling me that, uh, that this has happened. And they said, well, you better go and listen to your logging tapes. And by the way, we're demanding you give us the logging tapes because we want to hear exactly what happened. And I said, well, first of all, I'm not going to listen to the logging tapes because if I do, then I'll know what happened. And I'd rather not know at this stage. Now, the police are involved. And secondly, you're not getting the logging tapes without a court order. And I, I didn't know whether I could be that bold, but they went away and they came back the next day and they said, we've come for the logging tapes. And I said, well, show me your court order. And they said, we don't have one. And I said, well, why not? And they said they went to a judge and the judge said, well, no crime was committed because the bloke committed suicide. What had happened was the cops had botched the negotiation to, for a peaceful solution. And they were looking for a scapegoat and they were trying to blame the, blame the radio station. But I didn't know at the time that yeah. I could just demand a court order and hold my ground. <laughs> but I was I was really BSing them. And it was yeah. the truth. You, you you do need a court order to, to get tapes off radio stations because they own it. Yeah. And uh, it got very hairy, but that was... I know what you mean about because that was my first real leadership job, is you do get these situations <laughs> pop up and you really don't know... You've not been given any training in that area if something like that goes on. And, yeah, uh, yeah it's, uh, it was interesting. <laughs> I... Um, I believe that I was constantly being told about um, management being a manager. And there were a lot of managers in this organization. And I believe, and you can tell me if I'm right here, that you can't actually manage people. You can manage time. You can manage projects. You can manage budgets. You can't manage people. You have to lead people. Is that um, accurate? Yes and no. I mean, I mean the, w the way the world defines it, there's leaders and managers. I mean, you know, managing a budget. If you got three accountants working for you, they're man they're doing the budgets. Yeah, the accounting part, and you're in charge of them, so you're managing them. But okay, then comes yes, the dual roles. Right. So you got yeah. dual. A, mo a lot of leadership is dual roles because you know. Some leaders have no management responsibility at all, other than just to create policy and tell their That'd support. That'd be great. Hey, that's what I, that's the gig I want. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't like the management <laughs> side of it. <laughs> yeah, things can go. That's where things go wrong. So, yeah, definitely. well, things. That's where things go wrong in management. Management part, yeah. So there is a thing. Mismanagement is a real thing, then. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. So. Could you give us a Could you give us an example of, of that of where of what the what kind of thing that what that would oh, look like? All the account the accounting example, you know, mm -hmm. leaving off a zero somewhere or okay. adding a zero. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. nobody catches it until later. That's yeah. where the that's where the leadership comes in later is like uh, financial statements. Yeah, you know, CEOs and stuff review those. Yeah, and once you do them for a while, you know what you're looking at. Yeah. The number, the, the absence of a zero, or <laughs> something, something that normally doesn't cost X number of dollars suddenly costs X number of dollars. That jumps out at you on a piece of paper. Yeah. And yeah. then you go back and you say, "Hey, what? What is this?" Yeah. So, you know, so management is equally important then to make sure that yeah, the business right. runs well. It's not just about firing everybody up and getting them all pointing yeah. in the right direction. You've also got to be attention to detail there too. Yeah. My personal thing, which some academics would disagree with, managers are also leaders. It's a dual job. Okay. I okay. Mean, because, you know, a manager of a department of some of a retail store or whatever, they're also the leader of that department or store. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. They're, you know, uh, employees look to them for leadership, for how to do things. So you're they're, they're a trainer too in some cases. I mean, yeah. 
you know, so I mean, there there is dual responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's well, like in, in the military saying, you know, you got the leader, right? You got the the squad leader, but they're also the manager. It's a dual yeah. job. They're yeah. they're managing their, their their squad or their their company or whatever the case, whatever it is. Yeah. Well, you lay it out great in the book because you've got the results of the interviews and the conclusions, the different forms of leadership. You talked about the transactional form of leadership and the the, the other styles. What what were the other styles? It was, it was transactional. It was the transactional, which is, you know, that's a common one, like where you get rewards, like in organizations where you do a job and you get rewarded for it with bonuses or that's a transaction. Mm-hmm. That's how it's kind of laid out. Yeah, uh, there's um, adaptive, which is kind of what I was leaning towards is taking a combination of ways to lead people. There's the auto, the autocratic, which is the dictatorship type. Yeah, it's my way and the only way. And, you know, so yeah. those are some examples. There's yeah. one, there's a newer one that's called full range, which is also part of what I was leaning towards is taking several of the leadership styles and merging them yeah you know together so there's you know there's a lot of them and people keep coming up with new ones so well the more i talk to you the more i realize that uh the greatest leader i ever worked for was a guy called tom hardy who is sadly no longer with us and he was the boss at that radio station that i became the program director of. He was the program director when I went there as a disc jockey. In fact, it was the first UK radio station I, I went to as a morning show host. And uh, he was he was just quite brilliant. And I mean, I didn't know anything, but uh, he, w- he would talk about the difference between tactics and strategy. He said, you'd have your overall strategy and then you'll have your tactics. And in radio, it would be, you know, your your strategy might be to be the number one station in the market, age 25 to 34 year olds. And so the tactics you use are these things, you know, mm-hmm. we were skewed slightly female as well. So, you know, the difference between that, but the, the best thing he ever did uh, was me and my co-host one day, we really had played up on the air one day and we'd, uh, I forget what I'd said, but <laughs> An advertiser got very upset about it, so it was important. It was now going to cost the station money, and the salesperson who was was selling it was their client. Um, they wanted us, they wanted us ripped apart uh, by the boss. And the boss's office had a big glass window into the main sales office, so they, they everyone in sales could see what was going on in his office. But when you sat at the desk at the boss's desk, the boss faced out the window. And the rest of the office was behind you. So me and my sidekick were sat in this chair and they can't hear what's going on. So our boss has got this really angry face on and he's pointing at us and he's going like, that is one of the funniest things I've ever heard you do on the radio. But you've pissed off a client and the people in the sales office aren't happy. So when you walk out of here, you better walk out there and make it look like you've just had one hell of a dressing down. <laughs> and so everybody was yeah. happy. We we got that we knew that he respected us for the creative side of what we were doing, but the people in the sales office thought, well, they really got a telling off then. You know, everybody thought they'd won <laughs> when the real winner was the leader was the boss. He really yeah. was great. I don't know how you would describe that kind of that <laughs> kind of leadership. Empathetic, or I don't know. Um, I don't know how you describe it, but he was a great leader. Uh, yeah, the, you know, there's things like that. You know, I mean, you just have to. Sometimes things happen that it was good, even though it was bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It yeah. was. But but your book made me think of so many times like that, and many 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 bad leaders i worked for over the years who were just terrible inside and outside radio um yeah it was uh, it was a really interesting book to do how did you find the process of turning this one into an audio book um challenging my first thought was whether i should use the british accent or not you know? <laughs> so but i thought a good choice because it just has a good ring to it, you know. 
Yeah, I could have done it as American if you like, but I don't know whether know. whether you would have bought it. Be there. And I was like, well, I, I, I can find an American to do it. But <laughs> nah, I, I, I kind of like what you do with and everything I've seen on your site and everything. I listen to samples and yeah. Yeah, just, this, there's something about that accent. It just it's weird because I did one that was um it was about it was a bloke who it was a book about Bell's palsy, which is a condition where one side of your face uh, slopes, and it he was talking about his experience as a Bell's palsy, and he's an American, and he asked me to do it in a British accent, and he liked the fact because it was from his it was first person the book was written first person, and I didn't really understand why he wanted that but he just wanted him to sound like british <laughs> that, is, that is funny that you bring that up because you know I, I told you last time you know i had a stroke uh, like a year and a half ago but mm -hmm. i'm writing a book about that experience and about how to you know how to deal with it and, mm -hmm. you know for, for you know stroke victims in the future you know or, or caretakers and i was just thinking yesterday when i was looking at stuff about i'm still working on it won't have it done for a little while but I said, you know, I'm going to have Graham do the audio book. <laughs> and I'm going to put a little part in the beginning, a little humorous antidote in the beginning that you read about. By the way, you know, it kind of reminds me, I don't know if you get these um, T-Mobile, the phone company, uh -huh. cell phone company. Do you got T-Mobile in England there? Or no, I don't. I, oh, no, yeah, we do. Well, yeah, we do. We do. But we probably have a different way, advertising. Yeah. They had these commercials running here. You know, British accent guy talking all the great stuff about, and he ends the he ends the commercial with "and I'm British," you know, <laughs> with the British accent, the whole thing, you know, had nothing to do with the commercial, but the British guy doing. You know. Well, the gecko in um, what's the what's the advertising you've got over oh, there? Yeah. That I what's he? Geico. The, uh, Geico. Geico. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a British or it sounds British. British. I don't know yeah. if he is, but. Uh, yeah, he must sell plenty of. Um, is it insurance? What does he do? Uh, yes. It's insurance. It's insurance. Yeah. He must sell plenty, plenty of insurance. That little guy. <laughs> he does. He's been around a while, talking <laughs> like that for a while. So, <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, I'll have I'll have at least one more project for you in the next year here. So that'll be nice. I look forward to it because yeah. it's it's great working with you. And then this one being so different to the last one, although. I learned a lot from the last one about the Cold War and, you know, I mean, you were bringing all sorts into that one. You had Jane Fonda in there at one stage. That was a challenge. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, but, Writing you know. Writing it too was a challenge. You had to write it in just the right way to where I wasn't, eh, I don't know what the right word it is, but I wasn't something. Yeah, Whether yeah. What, political? Satan. Yeah, too political, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think perspective you got the... of the POW perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. well, you had a little bit of latitude because it was a fictional story, but it was based on the kind of things that some POWs went through. So yeah. you also had that caveat that, you know, it is a fictional story, It's uh, but it's to make you think about, you know, the relationship between East and West uh, yeah, and how, yeah. how the consequences of the Vietnam War went when it ended in was it seventy three? It ended. It it wasn't all. Yeah. It wasn't all over. It carried on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, well, I was so glad you chose me for this one, and I hope hope you still decide to do the, get me to do the, the next one when you do it, which is more personal story. So it's another uh, another dimension uh, to your writing work. So that is what's next for you. Is that the one you're working on now? Yeah, I'm working on that one. I got another one that. I have an American narrator for to another totally different. Is this the uh, pop pop one? Uh, no. Oh, I got that too. Said, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, that's a kids. That's a kids book. But yeah, uh, I got the mystery thriller series. It's called Farmerville. Farmerville. You mentioned that to me last time. Yes. Yeah. So, but I, I got the American. I got an American narrator for that one because yeah. I talked to you about it. And you said, "Well, you want a British guy talking about Missouri or?" You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, but no. So I'm so so. I got that one. I got six out already, almost seven now. In yeah, that yeah. Series, series, so you know. Yeah. So you're really so, moving into the audiobook world, then, really. Yeah, it's a, there's a lot going on there, you know, and we're selling some, um, and I haven't even tried to. 
you know, due to promoting yet, but just yesterday I looked in the uh, sales for for this one. How did that happen? I don't I haven't even done any promoting for it yet, you know, but something with algorithms or something on Amazon. I'm not sure what it is, but it's also because of the um I think I I'm probably making this number up, but I'm sure I heard that the last year of figures, which probably was the last calendar year, that audiobooks have grown like it's double figure percentage. It's something like twenty three percent or oh, something yeah, year growing. on year. They, they yeah. really are really uh, taking off. And there's an author I work with in Cardiff who I've done um, some fantasy books with, and he basically says if you're not if you've written a book and it's out there for sale and you're not turning it into an audio book, you're leaving money on the table because you've already written it. You know what I mean? And for the longest time, Aud- you know, Amazon Audible was the only only game in town. And yeah. I've been finding out with doing these other books, uh, the Farmerville series, that, oh, there's other ways you can – they're not the only outlet. Right, there's okay. Other, there is – there's another outlet you can use mm-hmm. that distributes to all of them. There's right, like, so your Barnes and so, Nobles and Spotify oh, yeah, and they're, they're, all the other ones, because Spotify yeah. are into it now too. Yeah, yeah, Spotify is the big one too. They're into it. So yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not just Amazon. I mean, you you set it up through ACX like we do. You know, I mean, and that that that's a simple process. Yeah, and then you just you take those files and Away you create go. an account with this other. Uh, they're called Find Away Voices, is what they're Find called. Away Voices. Yes, Find Away Voices was an audio book. Um, like an agency almost it put it put authors and narrators together yeah. in, in a similar way to acx but spotify bought them yeah so they are yeah. owned by spotify now yeah so, so they, they do it so a different way i think they have a casting director now and they cast books uh which is a way yeah. that that others i work with i work with an organization in connecticut called tanta who are part of when you see it on the book it says rb media it's recorded books and they are um and they they uh, they cast I don't even audition for them half the time. They just say, "Hey, you want to do this book?" And I go, "Okay." <laughs> oh, often they send me they send me a thing, would you, and would you like to audition for it? And but nine out of ten times I get it anyway, uh, yeah. even after an audition. And um, yeah, so I think that's that's. I don't know how many organizations there are like ACX because ACX is totally open, isn't it? You can you put your audition up, and it's an open audition, and you get right. however many. You know, some people have talked about over a hundred auditions for for one book. Um, but then the other organizers, the like Tanta, they cast them. So the, I, I don't know how the business side of it works, but they they have a casting director that that casts narrators to match stories. But Find a Way, I think, has just gone that way. Find a Way used to be a lot like ACX, but they've gone they've gone the other way, the the, the more casting kind of situation. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty easy to to upload them. I mean, you open an account, and you know, I did one uh, last week and. Took maybe twenty minutes to get the whole thing up there, and and then um, you pick who you don't want. To, you know, they they have like eighty different outlets. Right. You can click. Yeah. You can exclude them if you don't like. If you since you already already have an account with Audible, exclude them would find a way, and then all the others they distribute to. Oh right, okay. So that's it. So it's non-exclusive because uh, Audible gets a bit. Gets a bit uh, exclusive, doesn't it? They, they like to. Well, they give you the things. option, and oh, they, you get the option. Oh, great! Right, you get the option. So when I first started the audiobooks, I put non-exclusive. I mean, mm-hmm. I put exclusive, which is strictly with the Audible. Mm-hmm. And then after ninety days, you can request to get non-exclusive. Right. Okay, or when so you that... set it up at first, like this one, we set up. I put just non-exclusive from the get-go. Right. So I already got it set up at Find a Way. You know, so you're all set, you can go that way as well. All set and learning stuff and passing the knowledge on, so to my reading group people. Well, that's what uh, hopefully people who watch this uh, video will do, you know, because we get a lot of authors watch these as well and they'll get some ideas on on how the the business works. For for a lot of people audiobooks are very very new. For you they're reasonably new. And there are some people who are audiobook veterans, but the thing is, it is growing as a as a way to make uh, to to make money and to sell books and you know uh, sell them alongside the uh, 
the actual books and the Kindle books. You sell a, an audio book version as well. So if someone would like to get leadership, there will be a link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. Where do we find out more about Warren Martin? Oh, well, the um, oh, where do you find out? I got a website, um, leadership. I got web warrenmartinleadership.com. WarrenMartinLeadership.com. Yeah, that's any leadership related stuff. And then my other stuff, I got MartyMartin.net. 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 Because Marty's other... your nickname, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Marty that's Martin. That's my end name for the other stuff I do. So. Right. Well, I'll put links to those in the uh, in the description on YouTube as well. So we've got it all covered. Yeah. That'll work. Warren or Marty, it's been great talking to you again. Continued success, too. and it's another it's another winning book, totally different to the last one. Uh, it's not Forgotten Soldiers, this one. This one is Leadership, and the subtitle is? It's uh, uh, Outdated Theories and Emerging Non-Traditional Leadership. Check it out on audiobook, wherever you get them. There's a link in the description. Cheers, Marty. Thank you.